uh, we have the producer of Ayuni, Elham Shakarifar. If you just give us a wave, Elham, so everyone knows. And I'll read out a short bio for you. Elham Shakarifar is a BAFTA nominated producer, winner of the 2017 Women in Film and TV BBC Factual Award, and one of Screen International's 2018 Brit 50 producers on the rise. She received the 2016 BFI Vision Award and is now MINA and Iran Program Advisor for the BFI London Film Festival and Film Curator for Shabak Festival of Contemporary Arab Culture. So please welcome Elham Shakarifar to the panel. And on the other side of the screen, we have Yasmin Fedda, who is the director and writer and cinematographer for Ayuni. Yasmin Fedda is an award-winning BAFTA-nominated filmmaker and artist whose work has focused on themes from Edinburgh bakeries to Syrian monasteries and from geek anarchism to forcible disappearance. Yasmin has taught different aspects of film in various settings around the world, and she is lecturer in film practice at Queen Mary University, is co-founder and programmer of Highlight Arts, and is part of production company Black Leaf Films. So please welcome Yasmin Fedda. So, um, the first thing I was interested in asking uh, is that there are a lot of films that deal in one way or another with the war in Syria, the continuing war in Syria and the fallout of the war in Syria. Um, but I'm interested to know what, how, how you chose this way of approaching it through the very specific lens of looking at forcible disappearances. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I guess I'll start uh, answering this question because it started really with um, another film. I didn't set out to make a film about forcible disappearance, but this maybe reflects the reality on the ground. I started making a film about a priest I knew, Father Paolo Dall'Olio. Um, he's an Italian Jesuit who lived in Syria for over 30 years and set up um, a monastic community and I'd made some films with him in the past and he became quite outspoken and involved with the revolution and uprising and that actually is what started me off uh, was to make a film about a revolutionary priest that's when I reached out to Ilham and the other producer Hugh to make a film with Paolo because it was suddenly this really interesting moment of an individual taking this new journey and being very eloquent and outspoken um, so I re reached out to him, we met, filmed once, and then soon after he went to Raqqa to negotiate the release of prisoners, uh, not prisoners, sorry, kidnapped journalists um, in July, 2013. Actually, it's gonna be seven years ago this month. Um, and after he went for that meeting, he's never been heard from since. And it was that point that really started me on the journey to understand forcible disappearance. I mean, I was very connected with what was happening in Syria and knew about it but I hadn't thought specifically about forcible disappearance. And by trying to understand what happened to Paolo, trying to grapple with the feeling of absence, this Paolo-shaped absence, he's, he was like a much larger than life character. Um, I met with some of his uh, close associates, I met with his family, um, and then I started meeting more and more people telling me my brother, my cousin, my friend has been forcibly disappeared. And then I realized it was being used as a weapon of war in Syria. And eventually that's when I reconnected with the story of Basil. Um, I knew him a little bit in Syria and he um, was in prison for a long time. And actually this is um, a connection with Dana. She was involved with the Free Basil campaign mm -hmm. who were advocating for him while he was in prison, but he wasn't disappeared. He was in prison for three years. Um, and in 2015, he was taken from his cell and disappeared. So while I had been following and engaging with that in the background, I didn't think that would be a story I would follow on forcible disappearance. And then sadly, when that happened, I reconnected and it basically took a life of its own. I met Dana and then I met um, Nora, uh, Basil's wife. And that started me on the process, I guess, of, of understanding disappearance a bit more. And both of them, Paolo's family and Nora, Basil's wife and Dana, all trusted me with their personal stories and that kind of led me on it, on this journey. I don't know, Philham, you'd like to add anything? Um, maybe just to add, to come back to this question of um, how often Syria has been represented in film in the last 10 years and 
with my other hat as a programmer. I had reflected on this in the program in Shabak in 2017. I think around the fact that we see so much um, conflict on screen and it, it becomes, uh, it enables a sense of othering, I suppose and that it enables people in this country to feel like it's very far away and disconnected and that would never happen to me. And something that really, you know, when Paolo disappeared, it was very confusing for us on a very kind of, I mean, on the human level and as storytellers, it was very confusing to think, how will we, is what's right? Should we be making a film about this in the first place? Is it safe? Is it not? Um, how does his family feel? Is it, is it a good thing to do? Is it a bad thing to do? So we had all of these questions. And I think the process of us thinking that through was also, as, as Yaz said, you know, understanding how destabilizing, how much of a limbo that is, but also how difficult it is to imagine a future actually when there are such significant gaps and there are such unresolved questions. And then that somehow ties into the images that we have um, you know, that are most visible in the media and that have been kind of proliferated over the last 10 years that mean that Syria is understood within the kind of Western collective imagination in a very particular way that doesn't speak to a Syria that maybe Yaz knows or, you know, I have a tiny bit of knowledge of, but maybe, you know, seeing Paolo in Syria, in his monastery kind of gives you a completely different frame for and, and so that um, was also something that really motivated the film. Mm. I mean, his, his story reminds us that there were a lot of people who who went to study in Syria, you know, a lot of foreigners who went there and fell in love with it. A lot, So many of my friends who went to study Arabic in Syria, I mean, he was very well known for that, for international students. Yeah. Um, but when, when Paolo disappeared then, Yasmin, did you consider just scrapping the project or or was it always did you always know that that then you would just have to follow the reality i mean it's interesting as a filmmaker you don't always know where you're led and in the very beginning as alham said we had no idea what to do and i was trying to speak to people close to him uh, to understand whether yeah it was even safe to do something it made sense to do something so i kind of let it simmer in the background, I guess, for a while, um, both to come to terms with it emotionally, but also to think about if we were to make a film, what would it be? And that really started, um, I went to Iraq actually for another project and um, there's a small community associated with Paolo there and I went to visit them and it was the last place that he was before he went back to Syria that trip. Mm. And so I decided to go there and kind of get a sense of what was what, how people were feeling. And actually, perchance, his sister just was coming to visit. I didn't know her and I didn't know she was going to be there. And I extended my trip to meet her. And that was when I first started that story and, and understood that his family would be happy for me to film with them. So that's kind of how it started. It was sort of, I mean, it took us six years of filming bit by bit, you know. And then the same with Nora when I eventually met Nora. Like, we could only meet in little... <laughs> periods bursts of time here and there you know and so it was all these like little trips but I, I think what happened even though it wasn't by design filming over such a long period actually helped us tell a much fuller story about disappearance and its effect over many years because it's not just it's happened and that's it it actually resonates over a long time it's, it's an interesting challenge because you're making a film about something that isn't there yeah <laughs> it was yeah I mean that was our biggest problem let's say is like how do we make it make sense and I, I was really wanting to find a way to tell the story not only through although this is valuable but I didn't want to make a film where people were just giving us interviews and telling us about Basel or telling us about Paolo or telling us about what happened I really wanted to find another way for us to connect with them and we found ourselves in this unique position where I had archive of Paolo that I had filmed and actually through Dana and other people, I got access to footage of Basil, which was either footage he himself had filmed or his, his and Nora's close films, friends had filmed. And that made me appreciate that we had this like opportunity to tell the story in the present um, as much as we could. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when 
when that when all these things connected it was like that's how we're going to tell it we're not going to tell it by an absence we're going to tell it through their presence if that makes sense and then they're taken away from us in the film so i mean just as this is i mean there are many filmmakers in this space i think yeah. the time it took us to get to that place is quite significant you know yeah. we went on so many journeys through yes. <laughs> how to tell the story and this question of how do you make absence feel present. I don't think we had the key to the presence within the material until much, I mean, I, I, I don't know where to place the kind of marker, but it, it's one of those things sometimes when you're making a film and trying to work through a complex reality and complicated emotions in relation to it as well, to find the right way to do something because I mean, yes, you, how many countries did you travel to in, in the end and how many different iterations yeah. and how many different stories, you know, we also encountered along the way. And, you know, we, we were trying to think about, can we bring in, um, you know, like the destruction of monuments and how that speaks to the disappearance of people and all sorts of different yeah. themes. And this is the final frame. Um, but as this is a space of filmmakers or, you know, people who look behind um, yeah. <laughs> the, the finished film as well, as well. It's just, it took us a long time to get there. I mean, but it was that, quite, yeah. I mean, it was a pretty interesting process creatively if you think about it, because, you know, one line we tried was to use um, ancient um, uh, artifacts that I really connected with from Syria. They're these little idols, they're ancient eye idols, they're called. They're tiny little votive offerings, they think. Um, and Agatha Christie's husband found them in an archaeological dig with her, with her while she was there. And I just thought there was something so, to me, c connected between like discovering something in the ground. She was a detective writer. This is a mystery. You know, we thought that could be the way to tell the story, but it didn't click in the end. We had to, we had a new editor at one point and he was just like, no, we're throwing this out. And it was like, no. <laughs> we were yeah, one of those it. really hard moments. So you're like, but this yeah. is perfect. It all makes complete sense, but it didn't actually work. No, and he, he right. knew that actually it was just the emotional connection that is what made the film. And he realized actually it was the, the love stories that really pushed it through. Like the love story between Basil and Nora and Mackie and her brother. Like, I think he, he was the one who could just like zone in on that and, and just pulled that out that kind of raw emotion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, so what sort of shape was it in Elham when she first came to you? Did, did it resemble a film yet? No, it was actually, in, it was 2013 when Paolo, I think you were going to film with Paolo the first time and you started speaking both with me and Hugh at the same time saying, what, what do you think? This, this could be something interesting to follow. And we both thought it's something interesting to follow, you know, Paolo yeah. is such a, a kind of, you know, fascinating, beautiful, multifaceted character. And just he himself had such an energy that, you know, he felt like an amazing subject and what he was doing was amazing in itself. So at, at that point, mm. yeah. Yeah, pretty early on. we thought it was another film. Sure. That, that was the film that we were starting. And there's something very, I mean, you mentioned Elham, the sort of, overdose of destruction that we've gotten from most films about Syria and most of them at least the ones that get attention or win awards are really about the war in a very visceral sense they're about people being killed and things blowing up and it's you know that's that's essential but it, it is also numbing after a while and I think maybe um, it reduces the war to just one aspect of it and it, and I think in in a way, your film is a lot more upsetting, even though I'm, we're not seeing dead bodies. But that sense of loss is so profound in in the people that you've been filming with, and so human. And there's so many dimensions to each of those characters. Like mm. when we see Francesca laughing, you know, as she's recording that that press release about her brother. And, and of course, I mean, we, why wouldn't you? But it's, it, it reminds you that every one of these incidents is a human with their own complex stories and reactions and responses. And so there's something incredibly delicate about it. 
but but also by that through that delicacy it becomes much sadder mm -hmm. much more gentle but it's much more sad because of that um i don't know if there's a question there i just <laughs> i just wanted to say tell you how yeah. much I found it well i really appreciate that because i think it's also one of the hardest things to share is how do you make this a relatable problem or issue like it seems so unfathomable like what is this appearance you know and it's quite hard to explain but suddenly we're with paolo's sister in italy and she could you know and nora i mean they could be me you your friends you know they could be anyone and i think the trick was to try and find that kind of very human connection um mm. and i think the and and just to see how it's all connected it's not just in syria and so far away it's in someone's living room in rome <laughs> you know it's in someone's house in beirut it's 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 in london it's all over the place but yeah and and um so i was wondering i mean from your approach because it feels like and you you sort of said that said as much in the process it feels like a film that had a lot more information and structure and you kind of got more and more and more essential over months and months and months until you left with this incredible you know it's almost like an ode it's not i felt like i was watching this this poem being written in real time rather than a, a, a structured film but of course there are years of structure going into making it seem inevitable and just flowing like some sort of impressionistic story so how do you i mean it's a bit alchemy i guess but can you describe that process yeah i mean editing is such an interesting process and i think editors are kind of the magicians behind films really um mm -hmm. and like you say it wasn't like i mean we had as you know all filmmakers you have your master plan <laughs> you keep moving it around and then in the end it was all thrown out of the window but i think the things that worked, actually, it was interesting. Like, I actually cut a lot of the early scenes quite instinctively, just as a, like, a quick scene. And quite a few of those we used exactly as I cut them. But what the editor we worked with did was actually put them together in a way that felt more emotional and impressionistic. And kind of, he, he helped them have more meaning together. Um, because those moments, I mean, when I filmed with Dana, actually, I just, like, cut those scenes soon after and they were basically unchanged pretty much in the final film um but the meaning of them i think is what the editor does it's the alchemy is to to, to take you on that journey so that when we see dana when we see the cutout of basil it means something you know a little bit like sad and weird and confusing and i don't know inspiring like all these feelings at the same time and i think the alchemy lies there i actually it's something that really fascinates me editing or the way editors work, <laughs> you know. Um, I think it's a very delicate skill. Um, yeah, I don't know how you, I mean, it's interesting because it's really useful working with someone who can be a step away. So Ilham wasn't in the edit suite with us when we we're cutting, but would come in at certain times to watch it. And I don't know, how did you find the various morphs and changes? And well, editing is, I mean, it's one of my favorite parts of the filmmaking process. Yeah. I think it's the most, there is really something of how, what do you center and how do you tell a story really? What, what, what are going to be the, the tools, I guess, that you use? Um, I don't know whether we use, I, I generally cry all the time in, in edits as well. And, and my crying is used True. as a marker of what's, <laughs> what's kind of working emotionally or not. I'm not sure this was a film that we used so much in it, but you know, even when we were cutting the trailer, I was just crying and crying the whole time and just kind of, it is, anyway, um, that wasn't what I was going to say. Um, I think what's really interesting also about the different, the dynamic of the different people who work on a film is also how you experience certain moments and footage because I'll have experienced the story of what happened on the shoot, Yaz will have experienced what she was filming as she was filming it, the editor will be looking at it as this kind of uh, bigger picture, kind of meta narrative structure. And all of us bring those different perspectives into the, the narrative and to figure out how 
it can speak most effectively to an audience. Um, I mean, I think po poetry was really, in a sense, this answer because it gave us the space to yeah. be, to kind of embrace what is more fragmented and to embrace lots of different things, even down to the films, the name that we ultimately gave the film also carries with it this kind of, it does the deep poetry of what it means, uh, you know, my love or my eyes, but also the kind of the deep sadness of, of saying that, of you know, that expression in this context, because it's essentially, you know, the person who you, you consider to be your eyes is, is no longer there and therefore all you see is, is their absence. And I think that, you know, really kind of um, embracing the space of fragmentation and language, I think really gave us, um, it enabled us to, to build the narrative as, as we see it in the final film. Mm. And also, yeah, to add, I mean, it was a, something that started with the idea of the idols, the archeology span that we never used, but I, I was always interested in finding a way to kind of pull us out a bit from the intensity of the moments in the film. And in the end, that, that kind of uh, came about as poetry, you know, but there was always that intention actually, was just how do we step away a little bit and come back in, you know? Um, and yeah, poetry ended up being our answer to that. And in a way, I think what the idols, did and I think what I think we tried to carry throughout was the notion of being witness. I think, mm -hmm. you know, as, as we started off talking about the frames and the images that we have from Syria, and I think what we have a lot less of is just, you know, everyday human interaction. And yet, I think we really need to bear witness to, to those spaces as well, because that is actually what needs to be protected right now that's what that's the reason why it's important to care about what's happening yeah and, and that idea of bearing witness i think for this film is really interesting because it's also very in a way it's very meta narrative i mean there's there's well you i think your voice is the first one we hear isn't it reading the poem yasmin is that your voice yeah yeah so there's your presence that's already establishes itself very quickly and then we see a couple of shots of you filming. We see a couple of shots of other people filming, people recording voices. You know, a lot of uh, references to television news events. So in a way, it's it's you know it's about Syria, but it's also about the way Syria is represented. So you have these two layers working together. W was that something intentional, or was it just necessary as part of uh, as a device to tell the story because of this absence? That's really interesting, actually, getting people's reactions. That was not something I had thought about, uh, mm -hmm. how we framed it in the front as a way of witnessing. And um, it's interesting now that you say that, I guess it is actually important in the way we frame it, but I hadn't consciously decided, like that wasn't part of our conversations and, and how we framed the beginning and like how it's represented and the media and the news, it's all there, those layers are there, but. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you pick up on it right from the front, and you're right, it is there from the front. I don't know, yeah. So inspired in a way by the bus yeah. and the kind of the image, yeah. of kind of this notion of what is it that you're making present? What, who's in the frame and how are you centering them? Mm. Yeah, maybe it's because you never wanted to record those. That it's so difficult, it was so difficult to get Yaz to agree to have her voice. <laughs> oh, really? Why is that? Oh, well, it wasn't that. It was actually less my voice. I mean, I guess in much earlier versions, this is for the film geeks, I guess, but much earlier Sorry, versions of the film, the film, like, I just thought the way we were using my voice was not the right way. It wasn't the right story. Um, mm. And that's, I was kind of gr fighting that, I guess. I just thought originally that story was like, me telling the story of coming across this. And I was like, that's not interesting to me, you know? And I think the stories in the film are more interesting. Um, and I didn't mind my voice being in there if it had a purpose, but I felt it didn't really have that purpose in the beginning. Um, I see. No, yeah. I but, you, but we had to do it to figure that out, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. No, that's, I mean, one of the things I thought that was really powerful about it is that there's no, there is no narration and, and it, yeah. It's not necessary, but you know, it takes years of editing to get to the point where it's not necessary because you tell the story through everything else. And I think you know, the there was enough in the footage to not have to narrate it. Like Nora is so strong, Mackie's so strong, Paolo's so strong, Basil's mm -hmm. so strong, and we had enough 
footage. And I think particularly, I mean, besides the footage I filmed with Paolo in the past, like seeing Basil and Nuro together, which their friend had filmed, is like a moment. I don't even know why they filmed it, but they filmed this moment, this conversation they're having together that's so moving and so intimate. They're talking about fear, they're talking about love. And it was just the snippet and you see it and you're like, oh my God, that just really takes you into the middle of someone's relationship, you know? And that was really special. And I think there's no way you could describe that <laughs> through narration or interview. It was in the moment and the fact that, that that was there and we could use it really helped us tell the story of Nora. I mean, we see Nora from a young woman in love to someone who's, you know, I mean, she still was and still is a human rights lawyer and is fighting for the right to know and for justice. And there's this like crazy long arc. We end up with her, you know. Yeah, that footage. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. The footage in the restaurant where they're sort of describing their wedding or, and, and how they, you know, whether they're really in love or it's sort of a mixture. Sorry, I guess it's their wedding and then they're in the cafe afterwards. And uh, there is this incredible intimacy between them you know it's unmistakable how in love they are there's this you know Nora's face is beaming and really her eyes are yeah. like and then uh but then there's an amazing moment when when the friend asks Basil how long do you think this will last and he says something like the you know the moment it's only a short time now and you see on what I saw on Nora's face was total disbelief I mean just this look of fear she didn't she didn't believe it at all and yet it was sort of, the, you know, the thing, the right thing to say in the moment. And um, for me, that sort of defined the whole character of the film, which is these incredibly subtle exchanges that, you know, you really have to pay attention to facial mm. expressions and tone of voice. And, and that really tells you, the, again, because you're trying to film what's missing, but that really tells you the power of what's not there because of the power of those people's emotions, the intensity. Mm -hmm. And um, so where did you find the, the poetry? How, where, where did that come in in the process of? of uh, so we worked with an editor in the beginning and, you know, we'd sort of got all the building blocks for the film, but it wasn't quite working as a full structure. And that's when we decided to work with a new editor um, called Tom Ernst. Um, and he came along and suggested like, is there a song, lyrics, poetry, something that we could maybe use? So we discussed it and I kind of was just looking through the books in my house and I remembered I really liked the poetry of Dunya Mikhail, who I had her book in my house. She has these just, they're a lot of her poetry, at least in this one collection, they're quite short, um, but kind of to the point little poems and I just thought they were really beautiful. So we kept reading them when we were editing and eventually found the ones that we use. So it's kind of, there's one poem we use at the beginning and the end and then the three in the middle are part of one poem. Um, and so he kind of, it was interesting. It was actually quite good. I sometimes left Tom, you know, editing and I would come back and he just found ways to sort of structure the film with the poetry as chapters somehow, emotional chapters. Um, and they were quite nice because they sort of talk about things, but sort of from the side, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, um, but I thought reflected. So they came in quite late actually, you know, in the last phases of editing, but the thought was there. We tried different poetry and it didn't quite click and eventually that did okay and then and then you have this interesting construction where it ends with the same poem mm -hmm. at the beginning yeah it's, in in a way that's a very pessimistic view isn't it because it says that this never ends yeah interesting um i mean i hope it means that you understand it in a different way maybe but, yeah that too yeah yeah um but it's yeah, I hope you don't get the sense that it never ends, but just that you have a deeper understanding and that it can somehow develop. Um, yeah. And I suppose may maybe what doesn't end also is, you know, these relationships somehow or kind of like the, the, the fight that's undertaken on their behalf. I suppose there's something of, of that, but I mean, well, I, I, I know what you're saying. I, I am in in floods of tears by the end <laughs> like mm. it's very upsetting and it's very sad and it's but it's very real as well and i think that's why it ends in that circular space yeah but it also i hope reflects the fact that you know 
people will always feel those people, even if we don't know where they are. And hopefully one day we'll have an answer as to what happened. Um, yeah, I mean, it could be. feel could, them, yeah. It could be this, this never ending loop, but in a positive way, in the sense that that love is always there or that memory of them is always yeah. there. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, no, I can understand that. And, and I think it also gives this implication that there is never closure. And that's kind of one of the most heartbreaking yeah. things that, um, and, and again, to go back to sort of the mainstream or the more conventional Syrian film, where um, in a way, you know, seeing your loved one die in front of you is not as harrowing or disturbing as never knowing whether they died or, or, if, or never re really being, able to, being able to see the body, you know, and having to take someone's word for it. Um, so it, it's almost as though that absence will always be there, you know, even though there is a, there is a very optimistic moment, I think, where Nora says, you know, the, 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 the radio um, interviewer asks her, do you think you'll ever find the body? And she has an amazing answer. And she says, I have to. Yeah. She doesn't say yes. She doesn't say no. Mm. What do you, yeah. what do you think? I mean, where this is sort of outside the scope of the film, but for both of you, I'm just curious what that, what you think of that, that answer. I mean, I completely understand it. I think people have to get answers. They have the right to know they have the right to justice. Um, I also think Syria can't move forwards without the many, I mean, there's many layers of things that have to happen, but this is one of them. It'll be really hard to rebuild society with, I mean, it's more than 100,000 people disappeared, at least, you know, um, without answers to their fates. Um, that's an, uh, that, that is on the agenda. It can't be taken off. Um, even if it means that we find out difficult answers, we still need to find them. Um, I mean, we know from examples from so many other war zones or ex-war zones that that never goes away. You know, in Lebanon, there's still 17,000 people disappeared. Argentina and Chile and Bosnia, people are still looking for answers decades after, you know, the end of the war. Um, and people know, that's the thing. There are people who know what happened. So they need to eventually speak up about it. Um, and I think it's really important to keep the pressure up. That's why the work of Nora, Families for Freedom, No Photo Zone, lots of other organizations working to get answers is really important because you can't just forget it and put it to the side. And it's important now because people now know, you know, it'll be much harder to get the answer in 40 years mm -hmm. when people have died or moved on or forgotten or lost their memory. I don't know, <laughs> you know, but people know now. Um, yeah. And I mean, similarly, it's, I think it's really important that your film comes out now because we're at, we're at a stage where it's very easy for people to say and believe that the war is over. And I think for a lot of people, <clears throat> maybe who aren't digging behind the headlines, they might actually think the war is over. Yeah. I've even seen talks, you know, where people start on stage and say, now that the war in Syria is over, you know, the process wow. is sort yeah. of like, who, who, what? What are you talking about? So, I mean, there's something, I remember um, interviewing a fighter who had gone into, into Lebanon and it was really disturbing. I mean, the whole thing, the whole, that film I made was by far the most disturbing thing I've ever worked on. And when he was talking to me, the thing that stuck with me was, I, th I remember thinking, this country is gonna need a whole generation of therapy to get over this. Um, and what I thought was really important about your film is that you mention, at least Nora mentions that she's in therapy and, mm -hmm. and people describe, you know, discuss it very openly. And those of us from Middle Eastern backgrounds know that it's not an easy thing to discuss. It's not something that we, we do easily or, or talk much about. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm wondering what, what's the film's relationship also with those NGOs, those support groups that you guys were, were collaborating with? Well, just, I mean, expanding on also your previous question, this question of accountability, I think is really central to, I think it's, it is part of our relationship with all of these organizations. And I think it's really central to the conversation going forward. So any kind of imagination of a future. And I mean, we're talking about Syria, but we could be talking about any country, including the UK, which has such a kind of problematic relationship to its colonial past in particular, but equally in relationship to its, um, you know, its relationship to Syria, for example, and the hand that it has um, in this space too. So um, 
so the relationship with with these organizations I think exists on different levels um, throughout the filmmaking process I think we've been um, I, well I mean I think collaborators would be too strong because it, it, it wasn't a relationship in that sense but obviously we you know have worked closely with Dana whether it's in you know, filming spaces or kind of sharing information, uh, works closely with the Syria campaign, following different um, events that they were putting on or Families for Freedom. No Photo Zone, which Nora set up, has been set up much more recently. But in releasing the film, we also want to make it available as a tool for them to use to give this bigger context. So, you know, at this stage, um, we're planning much more audience discussion based a general audience kind of um, engagement. But come September, I think we'll be thinking a lot more around policy lines as well. And so those are the relationships that we are doing that work through. And is there a specific policy that you, you advocate for through, through the film? Um, so, I mean, there are a few things. There are, the, there are trials currently underway in Germany that I think are a kind of first step towards accountability in a sense that I think the film sits in a, in a kind of similar space with. Um, there is a call for um, detainee um, health in light of COVID and mm. you know the, the kind of question forcible and forced disappearance or forcible disappearance and detention are often kind of brought together in policy asks and so at the moment that's one of the main ones. Um, I think we, we basically, it's those two specific things at the moment that we're highlighting, but accountability, um, I think knowledge, justice, information, that's what we... Yeah, and in the case of, um, I mean, it's not what we're specifically doing, but would be kind of alongside um, to try and get answers, for example, about the more than 6,000 disappeared in Raqqa under ISIS, so that includes Paolo. There's a lot of uh, missing information, information that's being lost as well um, from the area. And there's also pressure to try and get information about that. Um, so I think it's just important to highlight. It, it's complicated because it's it's not just the Syrian regime that's disappeared people, although it's the most of them. There are other areas with other dynamics. Um, but that information, it's important for it to not get lost. I mean, every once in a while you hear in the news that they've maybe found a mass grave, but that I don't think there's enough support to even be able to deal with what is found in there and to document it properly, mm. for example. So I think this is the beginning of our journey, you know, and, and maybe those policy things will develop and change kind of as hopefully we spread the word and, and different people maybe find the film useful. I'm curious, I mean, this is another question that's a little outside the scope of the film, but it's more about the issue. But there's a moment when when Father Paolo says to camera, I think, or he's doing an interview and he says it's the world's moral responsibility to save us. And I was thinking back to, you know, the marches I, I joined in as well to to help pressure the British government to not bomb Syria, not get involved. And um, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not 100 percent sure if that was the right if I was if I took the right decision, you know what I mean? If it was on the right side. And it's very, it's hard, it's so hard to know, but I'm, I'm just curious what your perspective is on whether yeah. there should have been more foreign intervention. I actually do think so. Um, I don't think, I don't know what it necessarily should have looked like, but I do think so because there was already intervention from so many actors from quite early days, mm -hmm. whether it was invited by the Syrian regime or not uh, on the other side, but it was already a world platform um, early on and what Paolo was saying and that was an interview he did it was the last interview I filmed with him actually and oh. it was something he was advocating for a lot was actually we need peacekeepers on the ground this is the only way that's going to stop arms there's no other way mm. we need accountability uh, we need access to the prisons so Amnesty International for example should get oh not Amnesty um which or uh the Red Cross, Red Cross. There, should get access to the prisons to see what's happening who is advocating for that kind of international presence in Syria because he could see how bad it was getting. And that was in 2013. Um, 
and I I do kind of I'm on the side with Paolo because I think it was quite clear that there was it was difficult to find a way out of the situation getting worse at that point. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that you should have bombed Syria, not that kind of intervention, but there was other kinds of intervention that could have taken place as difficult as those decisions were to be taken. Um, I think they were important to consider. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because sort of what we're left with is just one major international superpower and that's it. And everyone else has to do what they say. Uh, yeah. It's interesting how those dis discussions were also framed in like bomb Syria or don't bomb Syria. Yeah, so we'll there was one possible intervention or one possible relationship, I guess, one possible power dynamic between these spaces when actually, as Yaz was saying, you know, this is much more connected it's it's there is a much bigger relationship it's historical it's present it's ongoing and it, it exists in different ways and so I think this also speaks to how the narrative is so flattened by many many things but also the media the way the media is reported on Syria the way that yeah this kind of fatigue that you're talking about at the, at the beginning also contributes to these really kind of flattened understandings and so you know, as say civilians, we don't feel the the um, we don't feel that we have any power to to engage, and we don't know what to ask for. And so, I think that's where also our drive to expand the narrative comes from. But I also think you know, with the maybe the march you went to, you know, it was kind of against British or American imperialism in the region. But I think part of that conversation is there's also Russian and Iranian imperialism in Syria, you know, that's yeah. also a big presence and you can't ignore the, the effects of that that have, have happened since. Um, so I think it was a lot more complicated and Paolo was so passionate about finding a way out of what was happening in Syria for a peaceful transition, for a democratic transition. Um, and he could see that it wasn't going that way. And he really felt that like, thousands of peacekeepers on the ground could have been one way. Mm. I don't know if that was the answer, but it was definitely something he was thinking about and was actually speaking to many people about. But. And, and we don't know anything more now about him, do we, since the film was, was over, since the film was finished? So that footage of him um, at that protest in Raqqa that's used in the film is the last known footage of him. Mm. And then in terms of news about him, it's been there's been lots of rumors over the years that he was killed, that he's been exchanged with other prisoners, that he's been moved, um, that he's still alive. Um, even last year when there was uh, battles, the kind of final battles with ISIS, there was bits of news, rumors coming out that he was still alive, uh, but they've transpired to nothing. Um, mm -hmm. So just rumors. Yeah, there's also, I mean, in the Italian press, there were, you know, big reports about his death as well, and, and that aren't actually supported necessarily by the family. So it's really interesting to see how his, his story has been kind of just taken in lots of different directions. And how did you feel like the, the, the opinions of those two, Nura and Francesca, changed over the course of your filming? Because I, I noticed also near the end, Francesca starts to talk about Paolo in the past tense without flinching, as though it's, it's sort of understood that he was rather than he is. Did you notice their perception of their loved, loved one's fate changing? Yeah, interesting. Um, so Paolo's sister is called Maki, and she... Oh, sorry. Well, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, uh, but she... Um, I mean, I think it's a very difficult thing to know in what tense to speak about people. And Mackey very much spoke about him in the present for a long time. And I think she still hopes he is still alive because they've had no information about what's happened to him. And we actually have no idea what could have happened to him. But I think over time, probably what changed was how she was able to talk about him. And with, with me and Nora, because actually my relationship with Nora same with Mackie, really happened on film. Like we met, the first time we met, we filmed. <laughs> Same with Paolo's sister. Um, I think Nora, because she had, she had been given information that he was executed, although no evidence, you know. Um, I think she accepted that that had happened, but there's still the unknown reality, like how, where, when, 
mm. why you know all these questions are still very much alive um but i think i don't know the thing that really amazed me over the years of filming with both of them was just how strong they are actually and how inspirational are they, and how despite the difficulty they're still quite hopeful in being able to achieve some answers eventually and i think um yeah but the switch i don't know yeah i guess i'm a little bit less attuned to the switch because i was like alham says what i remember is the moments i met them and i don't always notice because i'm changing with them i guess over the years I don't maybe, know how, yeah. maybe the switch is also to do with the maki like started to become more involved in the spaces with say families for freedom where with alongside other women she was talking about her loved one who was forcibly disappeared and in those spaces she was also speaking in English whereas elsewhere she was I suppose who she was communicating with shifted a little bit right. and at the beginning it was much more within the Italian space um, and you know she could articulate herself very clearly in those spaces and I think when as it moves along it becomes bigger she I think what's what I find incredibly moving about her journey is that she realizes quite how connected she is to so many people and sees the, the scale of things as well. And I think that contributes to almost like a different understanding of, of yeah. what's happened and articulating her reality in English and to people alongside other people who probably you know, the first people she'll have met who know actually viscerally exactly what she has been going through. And so I think maybe that's the biggest shift with, with Maki. Right. That, that, I, that I kind of felt through the film. And, and there's even, I mean, you were saying, Yasmin, about the hope, the, the hope that they have. And there's this incredible scene where Nora is saying, I don't hate anyone. Yeah, uh, which which I find extraordinary. First of all, I, I I could never I could never feel like that. Um, but it it I started to think about also the structure of the film in a way that it maintains this balance. That you know there are moments where we're we're sort of horrified and outraged, and then there are these very tender moments where we're kind of drawn in and we just remember relationships and love and family. Um, so you you know you two as as filmmakers now from the creative side, how did you orchestrate that? How did you achieve that really delicate balance? That, that's the dance, no, of what you want to achieve in a sense, like to kind of move from the micro to the macro and the kind of the personal mm -hmm. to the, you know, the perspective in inside, outside. It's, it's the years, say, that took us seven years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, um, can you kind of give us an idea of that timeline? Is it seven years filming? Is it a bit it of was, filming and long pauses? Yeah, it was like filming over six years, I guess, but, but in bursts because it was when something was happening. So for example, Mackie, Paolo's sister, was, called me up one day and she was like, we want to film an appeal. <laughs> Will you come <laughs> and film okay. it? So I was like, okay. And I was like in the middle of doing something else in another country and you know it was quite hectic but I went to Rome for two nights did that and but I told her you know I, I can help and film but I actually want to film a scene you know I, I want to film what's happening with you guys and, and film the whole little thing you know um, but it was quite a stressful I mean I have to admit a lot of this film I found quite difficult like in the moment emotionally it was quite stressful I didn't really it took me a while to learn how to like ask and be because it just, everything felt so sensitive and so raw mm -hmm. and sometimes you're like am I pushing I mean I guess you always wonder that but I hadn't as much as this film because you know I didn't know how much I could push if I wanted to push or if I should be there or not but actually people did open the door to me but it took a little while for me to feel comfortable with it because I guess I was also feeling very confused and emotional about it and you know in some scenes I can feel it because I'm like shaking, <laughs> you know, it's not like beautifully framed footage. And then sometimes, you know, Hugh was also filming and that looked better because at least he wasn't as emotional as I was, at least in this the moment, <laughs> you know. Um, but also just in reality, and I think maybe other filmmakers, I had a baby in the middle of it. <laughs> oh, so, okay. so there was like a lot, it took a long time, um, both distilling the thing, you know, but also 
managing, you know, all this other stuff. I mean, when I was filming with Dana, I was pregnant. When I first met Nora, I was pregnant. Oh, okay. And it's quite tiring, <laughs> you know, if you want the slog, the behind the scenes slog, yeah. you know, but it had to happen, you know, and kind of. Um, you know that what you're describing, that sort of, I mean, you described it as, as, uh, as a negative, I mean, your, your camera work or the sense of uncertainty, but I thought, and I noticed it in the film, but it's, all, it's in a lot of footage. And in, in many ways, you very obviously selected the footage that was more, um, more aimless, some more roaming, more impressionistic. But it works much better to create this sense of poetry. Mm. Because there is, I mean, the whole point of their lives is this uncertainty, right? There's no basis for, for even truth. There's no basis for even the simplest question of, is this person alive or dead? So the fact that the camera is is always f flowing with conversation and mood rather than certain and determined, I think works much better. You know, I couldn't imagine this as a beautifully shot aesthetic. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And but I think you're right. Like the frame carries with it a kind of an emotion, which in a sense, it was the only way this would ever be made because I, I think seven years also speaks to so many questions of how to best tell the story and so many different people that we encountered along the way and so many stories that we actually didn't end up telling in 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 this frame but somehow tangentially are brought into it and you know so many last minute trips and i think it speaks to all of those things and and that also speaks to this limbo and not having you know this is the the documentary space is kind of hard to predict sometimes like what you're going to do but very often you have a kind of project projected aim and a kind of arc that you'll follow mm -hmm. and here I think we didn't have an arc for the longest time we would we were just kind of gleaning things that would help us make sense of this big picture and I think and so it, it's kind of inevitable that uh, that you know there's an emotion that translates through in the way it's being filmed because everything is very raw and there there are really no certainties including how yeah. and who and why and exactly. you know like so yeah i think the term gleaning is really good because actually there's such a mixture of footage in the film like some stuff was filmed on mini sd tape that i filmed with paolo in 2004 hd tape footage of basil there was some filmed on phones on cameras um there was footage uh, that, you know, different people filmed on different formats, basically, um, and up to 4K material, the new stuff, you know, all mixed together. So it was, I think, uh, you know, and I think uh, after a certain point, we realized we shouldn't fight that. We should just embrace the messiness of it. You know, both it is messy, the reality, the story is messy, but also the, the texture and the material is a bit messy and all over the place. But I think it tells us something about time, the ways people film things, um, you know, Basel filming as well is just kind of amazing. And just having this stuff from a hard drive that Dana had, it was quite amazing to see this footage, you know, just there and suddenly you're like, oh my God, this person's here, their voice is here, you know? Um, so it was just, yeah, it was actually on a creative editing level, quite interesting working with so many types, different types of material, you know? Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, and, but it, I mean, definitely the film turns it into a benefit, you know, rather than uh, a challenge, something you have to get over. Um, and you were talking about, so maybe it'd be interesting time because Elham, you were saying that, you know, you sometimes imagine a narrative in a documentary and then it changes. Um, that could also describe the, the release of your film, right? Because we yeah. you had a, a specific release. Nice in segue, Saeed. And, <laughs> Yeah, and then um, and then the world and and coronavirus had a different idea. So, can you tell us about how you changed the strategy and what you did to release online? <laughs> yeah, I mean, at, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I kept saying, oh, "Documentary filmmakers, we're resilient. We're equipped. The thing's never going to plan. You know, we can reorientate." And and you know, now I'm just like. Oh, when, why, this is like the longest film. Um, I, I um, yeah, do you want to speak to that? Should I? Oh yeah, um, I mean, I'm happy first to both, yeah. But I, um, 
I mean, it was interesting. So we had a release, our release at CPH Docs as our premiere, and then it didn't, you know, uh, beyond that, <laughs> it was quite hard to have festival screenings and all that. So the kind of regular life of the film, I guess, was paused. And the three of us kind of talked a lot about, okay, what do we do? What's the best way to do it? And eventually came up with the idea to release it online, to translate it currently in seven languages, hopefully more one day, um, to make it accessible as much as we can at the moment. Um, and to also, you know, highlight these stories of the disappeared, because I don't know, maybe I'm cynical, but I do feel, I was talking to Saeed at the beginning, I do feel like a generation of films is going to get a little bit lost um, mm -hmm. over the next year or so. I mean, some of them will, will survive the COVID, the ones that were being released in the early parts of this year, but I'm not feeling so hopeful that they will have such a life. <laughs> and we realized we had to take it into our own hands um, and do it ourselves, essentially. Yeah. Ilham, is that how you feel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. we, as a team, it was important, you know, we were aware of the, the subject of our film and kind of thinking about what's the most important thing and decided that access really, um, in an international sense, was the most important thing. And we thought about um, translating into languages that made sense on a policy level, but equally on a, on a relatability um, level. So like it's translated into Spanish and, you know, we, we intend to do work in, in other, you know, with countries that have also experienced a forcible disappearance and that might be good kind of, um, you know, there are bridges that I think we can build between these spaces. Um, but yeah, I think it's, I, I've often distributed the films that I've produced and I think it enables you, it's not, all, it's not my ideal, but I think in, this, in the context of a film industry that's driven by metrics that aren't necessarily the same as the values of the film, um, you have to find something that fits the kind of the values and the, what's important for you. So there are all sorts of things for, around like who are we centering and how are we doing that what language are we using um who is it accessible to and how is it accessible to those people it, these are the things that were driving our our decision and then we partnered with um the syria campaign with amnesty international and with no no photo zone so those are spaces that will be pushing the film out to their networks and you know, ensuring also that it's framed with discussion where relevant with a kind of policy ask or with an action. And so it, it also enters that space um, as well. But yeah, it, it wasn't what we had imagined. Right. <laughs> what we had imagined, you know, it sat in a much more traditional space. What was important to us is that very quickly we decided what we do um, in Italy and we were in discussions of what to do in the Middle East region. And so, because those felt like two kind of very like key to the to the film story to the people in the film, um, and in a way we've we've continued the re the release online with those same with those same kind of two areas in mind, but we've expanded it slightly as well. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, Yasmin, you you were saying um, that you didn't well these films that will get lost, let's say films that would have been doing the festival circuit but aren't but i think what what we've always lost with the festival circuit is that the film is so inaccessible for so long mm -hmm. you know and i think it's really i'm sure all of us have experienced yeah, that really <laughs> infuriating when you read about a film that's amazing and it's doing well in festivals and it looks incredible and unless you live in a city with a documentary festival you, you yeah. have no seeing it for at least a year and even then you know it may not be distributed online because it's seen as a lesser a lesser medium but with this film um it it can be seen everywhere all the time i think in many ways these films might have more legacy than films that went into theaters and then two years later turned up online yeah. when no one's interested anymore it'll be interesting to see i mean it's an experiment i guess and it'll be interesting to see um also, I mean, we're not doing it in the same way, but, you know, Basel was hugely involved with like um, open source uh, internet stuff and activism and he was a hacker and open source developer and, you know, making stuff accessible. The film's not accessible in exactly the same way, but like it's the beginnings um, and I hope it's a way to get it to people. Um, 
slowly, slowly. I mean, you know, we have yet to, for example, we've translated the film into Russian and, you know, mm. we have yet to, to really engage with Russian audiences, for example, that could be our next thing. <laughs> you know, we're slowly building it up because also we're a small team. It's kind of DIY and we're building it up day by day um, and doing each section. Um, so I hope, I mean, I hope so. I really hope that, you know, in a few months time, we can say this was a really good way to release the film is, I mean, I feel it's a good way. It felt like the right thing to do, but I hope that in a few months we can say, yeah, it's really worked out. You know, people are engaging with it. People are using it, people watching it, sharing it, you know. I think so. I mean, I hear, I've heard a lot of people who say, you know, it's supposed to come out, but they don't want to release it online. So I'm waiting for the festival circuit 2021. And I just, my instinct is it's not going to survive, you know? Yeah. Make it, it kind of depends what matters to you, I guess. And I think, unfortunately, the yeah. film industry is built around, you know, quite problematic notions of what success looks like. And, and with documentary film, it's a really dangerous road to go down because we only hear of the kind of exceptions to the rule. And, you know, there are so many beautiful, important, urgent films of value that don't have big enough stages. And it's because of all sorts of things, including the fact, or if we're talking about the UK, I don't know that there are enough, I don't know that there's enough um, space or support or care for documentary as a form. You know, there's no space on TV for it anymore. You know, there are all sorts of ways in which really the craft of documentary is it's, it's, it exists for a very small niche of people and of course you know there are festivals there are individuals there are spaces doing amazing work but it's also to reach um beyond that and you know to be able to have conversations you know that the film should be or tries to be accessible to anyone um who might you know and, and i think that notion of someone kind of just switching on a tv i mean i don't know who switches on tv anymore but um, <laughs> You know, you know what I mean? This kind of like random coming across something and just like being immersed in someone else's story. Having lost that, I think, is something that has like disproportionately affected our lives and our ability, our ability to, to, to be resilient, to understand kind of how we place ourselves within the world. I think it's impacted on this country's ability to engage with a pandemic, for example. And, the, you know, I think all of these things really are, in connected, are, are interconnected and they speak to why this form is so important. So it just, I mean, it just made no sense to kind of try to work with that yeah. structure. That structure doesn't work. It doesn't serve the form. It doesn't serve stories, it doesn't serve the filmmakers. I, I don't know what it serves right now. And I'd love to be proven wrong, but I just can't see it. So yeah. it's, this felt to to be in a sense and particularly in relation to the the moment to be the right way to do things and you know what's interesting when you have you know with with um you know you have the power to make certain decisions and, and the responsibility to make certain decisions so the fact that it's available online means that we can see where it's being viewed and we can do work in relation to that we can kind of pivot in relation to this um to how it's being engaged with it's difficult because we're a small team, we're juggling a lot, we have limited resource, but that there is something really interesting in that. And there's something that still enables us to center what's most important to us, I guess, mm. in, in that process. So you released it on July the 1st. Mm -hmm. is, are there any interesting stats that provide insight so far on how well it's done or where it's been seen or? No, I actually don't have access to the back end. I like ask every couple of days, I'm like, guys, views, what? I think we're probably a bit early, but I think what we've done is, I don't, so the, the way that traditionally you'd imagine a film's release is that you kind of, you kind of front load everything to, uh -oh. you know, along, similar to the, the film release model at cinemas, you kind of imagine that your beginning would be the most important thing and everything needs to build up and everyone needs to watch then. But we were very aware that, you know, A, it's the summer, people have been locked down for ages, everyone's used to watching films online, but they're used to watching films for free. And then, you know, like all of these various different things. Um, so 
we decided that what we do is that we we kind of imagine our release period as as a kind of two month window in mm -hmm. which we try to do lots of different discussions and events that speak to the spaces that we already know and then based on the response to that we'll expand to spaces that that have shown specific interests right so that's yeah. that's the approach and um we were meant to have a couple of discussions that were postponed so weirdly this has become the first discussion we have oh, great. Uh, about the film which sits in a much more kind of like craft space in a sense but obviously there are lots of discussions around Syria specifically and policy um but equally you know we we have one um talk we've got a talk with Doc House on Friday we'll have talks with organizations that highlight the work of women right. um, and the position of women in a situation of um well conflict but specifically um forcible disappearance have we lost Yaz? we have but she's hopefully coming back oh. <laughs> right now hello oh, yeah, there she is <laughs> um yeah so so we imagine like we've expanded the weekend to a two-month window mm. and i think that's when we'll be able to, to to have more kind of interesting information yeah i see what you mean and and I guess um, I mean it reminds me inevitably it reminds me a bit of a Syrian love story which you also produced and put out. Uh, w was Hakaweti already established then, or it was sort of no. before? Okay. No, it's our third birthday today. Oh wow! Today. Yeah. Happy birthday! Woo! <laughs> so um, so I wonder if if this is now a sort of. Uh, a sort of genre for you, Elham, where you know you. Where I produce and distribute. No, no, I mean. When I'm trying to run away from, I keep getting pulled back into it. It's really. No, not that. I mean, maybe, but I meant more the the style of the film, which is this kind of, you know, a much more personal, familial, humanistic perspective on a story that has produced much more sensational work. That yeah. seems to be the 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 tone I mean, of your work of your of your company. Yeah, I, th I think what we, it's kind of um, thinking of the quieter voices in these kind of spaces where there's a lot of very um, louder and kind of much more aggressive narratives that are actually much more, much flatter in a sense. And mm. I quite like the word messy in a sense around, you, you were using around the different types of material that we have. But I think, you know, life is messy, nuance is messy. It's really messy sometimes to understand where you stand in relation to things. And actually, long, you know, films that are made over time can give you insight to that confusion. And there's real value in being honest about confusion. So I'd like to think that I make films in that space of confusion somehow. Um, but one thing I would say about A Syrian Love Story to this film is that that was the first film I really like distributed. And I did that because I was so like, I just couldn't understand why nobody would release this film. I couldn't mm. understand why it wasn't being put into cinemas. And at that time, it was related to the narrative around Syria. And I, it was related to the narrative around Syria. And so this is 2015. And, you know, what we saw play out over a Syrian love story, which was made over five years, was that every single year in that process, people would say to us, you must finish your film because the serious story is happening now. Mm. You know, and actually as filmmakers with responsibilities to your subjects and your story, you kind of think what is important um, isn't necessarily dictated by the news agenda and maybe there's real value in stepping away from that and the film should speak or will eventually speak when it does on its own terms. But I think we saw a similar thing with this film in the sense that that we did really get a lot of you know people do say these horrific things like there's already been a Syria film or there's been a Syria film this year or that you know we've seen such big Syria films that da 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 and this is such a narrow frame and such a problematic frame um around what gets made and what doesn't get made and then what gets seen and how it gets seen and so it is quite depressing that the same narrative from 2015 plays out five years later in a sense, because it means to me that the industry 
hasn't changed, the landscape hasn't changed, the media hasn't changed. And somehow it doesn't actually matter how much experience you accrue um, within those spaces. You're not kind of, the relationship with you doesn't change either. So unless we were to tell a much more kind of flat narrative, I don't think we would have been able to engage with those mainstream spaces. Yeah, so, I can imagine. And, and, and also I can see that it hasn't really changed that much. I mean, I think, I think we're, we're in a moment of reckoning where it can change, but we have to put a hell of a lot of work into it to, you know, for it to change, for us to emerge with a better industry. But I think the, the big point of this reckoning that we're in is about who needs to change. Mm -hmm. And I, it's really about, you know, there may be, there are people and there are spaces that have been calling for and trying to bring in different ways of thinking and working for a long time and it's not actually for them to change it's mm -hmm. it's for structures to really think about you know accountability is and you know this is how it's it's always fascinating to me why a film like like the one we've made sits very narrowly in in the frame of being understood as a syrian film because yeah. accountability is not a syrian like it's not a syrian issue per se, it's an issue that can resonate in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, disappearance in itself, in, this, in the context and the form that we've told this story is very particular, but I think you can, you, can, you can understand something of that reality through, you know, death and bereavement and, you know, the, all of these spaces are kind of, um, they sit alongside each other. And so it's really amazing to me that films are simplified into a kind of this is a Syrian film. Do you know what I mean? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I don't know. My experience of identity is so not straightforward and quite complex. And in film, yeah, they try to say like Syrian director, this kind of director, that kind of director. And the film, as me as a director, is a lot more complex, um, but it's quite hard to express that. And I think it's a shame that in our language and the way we talk about things, they have to become so simplified rather than accept that they're complicated and complex and there's another way to talk about them. I don't know if that makes sense, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, kind of in, in the very simple, you know, all the tick boxes and the things that we need to fill out, you would never, I, you know, we never automatically assume where somebody is from, for example. It's not simple, it's not as easy as one space and and actually so that speaks to the kind of films that we're that we're making and trying to fit into this space that only understands things in a very rigid way yeah and, and i think you're also the sort of work that you're both doing is is unique in its position in sorry my cat is attacking me for something <laughs> now um in that it's it's not let's say commercial cinema but it's mm -hmm. also not radical experimental cinema that that doesn't you know has absolutely no narrative it's 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 doing two things i mean it's fulfilling the requirements of cinema but also trying to innovate and change the industry itself at the same time so it's sort of it's a huge burden that you've taken on thanks <laughs> but but a very noble one i mean especially now because i think that's necessary and i think i think one of the best ways of doing it is through your work um, but it, it does make me think of the film has this incredible movement between the very personal when you're sitting there with, with say, Nora or you're seeing old videos of Basel and you feel like you're really right there and this is the most important thing in the world. And then there's that scene with you, Dana, where you're on the streets trying to get people to sign a petition and suddenly you see the, sc the scope of your world in relation to the world around it, where nobody knows or really cares who these people are. Mm. And it's sort of, it was heartbreaking that scene because it suddenly reminds you of the indifference outside of the, the world of the film. And it, and it started to get me thinking about what's happening now where yeah. you know, a lot of us are on the streets for change for one thing or another. Um, people are campaigning, they're taking the political route, they're taking the activist route. And yet every once in a while you realize there are a lot of people out there who don't care. <laughs> but I wonder as the, as the director, Yasmin, where do you see your work? I mean, what, what role do you see it playing in these changes? 
That's interesting, actually, um, to see it in a bigger picture other than one, although we were talking about it's hard to compartmentalize. I have been seeing it much more in relation to Syria because I'll be honest, in the last COVID period, you know, my world's become much smaller. And I've been, when I've been talking about the film, it's been very much in relation to Syria. You know, there are court cases in Germany. There's a Caesar law that's come in that's very controversial and complicated. There's a lot of things happening. And so I've been thinking about it in that lens. But I guess in a general way, I think, I hope that the film can be used very much for that world, for that specific world. But if there's a way, I mean, the bigger, the bigger thing is what you were saying, I think, on a more industry level. Um, and I do see film as both art and activism. I don't really see a distinction necessarily between those things. I think they quite fall into each other. I don't think they necessarily are different or in tension with each other. I think the making of a film, I mean, the making of this film was my way of saying this is terrible this is bullshit <laughs> it has to change we have to get accountability it's my way both psychologically to deal with these difficult emotional things but also to be active so the actual making of film i think has a lot to say it's not just the issue but actually the making that that's also an activist thing so i i don't know it's it's an interesting question because it's also hard for one film to make massive change but i think we're one piece of a much st larger struggle and i hope that we fit into several of those struggles, you know, the one about detention and disappearance, maybe one about the industry and diversity and change, you know, for independent film, I don't think independent film gets enough credit as it should, <laughs> you know, no. um, there's so many layers uh, that, you know, I'm happy to talk for, <laughs> support. Right. Yeah. And, and you get that feeling. I mean, it does, you can see that you, you're releasing it with this, with this impact, um, program as well but it doesn't feel like a campaigning documentary you know it just feels like a beautiful personal story thank you no that's that means a lot because i think that's what i mean i don't think there's a difference between the activism and art it's it's not about making a campaigning film it's about making something that i hope people will connect with and that's where the activism starts and it's something i think that paolo was kind of amazing with he was very good at creating spaces to just come and talk Sometimes that's all you need is just a physical space. People come and talk, share experiences, disagree with each other, whatever. But like bringing people together is something really important. And I think that's what film can do in a virtual way. It's maybe going to work in a different like way than, than it used to. But I still think it can still have that value. Um, I hope so. Yeah. Um, did anyone else, uh, any, any of the viewers have any questions i've just been i mean because i didn't see any come in so i just kept talking which i'm very adept at doing but if um if nobody else had any questions or comments we can wrap it up i think because i that was a very suitably optimistic place to to end i think i feel like dana wants to say something i know i want to hear dana <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you for Dana because actually Dana opened up a door that was I didn't even know was there. Um, the door to Basel, um, to reconnecting with Basel, the door to Nora, and also to herself because she's in the film. And I, I just think, can I just say you're you're also larger than life and really great to have filmed with you. Um, and it was like you were key in opening up that whole story, which ended up becoming a really important backbone of this film. You know, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, I want to say something. It's says, yeah, it's, uh, I'm a filmmaker. I'm an editor, actually. And I worked with Basil on making a couple of BBC films that we made back in 2011 together. And I just think one of the reasons he got called to uh, these two films. Um, but on the way of me meeting him, we met online and I flew to Beirut to meet him. Uh, four or five times the scene where he's uh, being interviewed by the BBC, I filmed it because we were always in safe houses and everything. Uh, they were attacked, the Syrians were attacked at the time in Lebanon because they're like, don't bring your revolution here. Um, so it was very tense times and I remember the fact that Basa gave me those hard drives um, not knowing even what they are on them. You just like take them in case I disappear, you might need them. 
And me as an editor, I always kept them because I always felt like, yeah, one day I'll make a film out of this. But I felt like the Free Basel campaign was more powerful and created more data about Basel, got him to be known everywhere, got Nora to have a voice, actually got Nora to continue becoming a human rights lawyer, uh, got me to meet so many people in the open source community. And so it was more powerful than a film in my state, especially that I was very close to the story and very, very emotional about it. And that's key one not to do a film about. <laughs> so I I was very proud and honored to have Yasmin do it and do something with Basel's story in that kind of delicate story, especially with Father Paolo as well, because they even know, knew each other. Yeah. So a very um, close connection and a beautiful piece of work. Like, I'm very happy this film has made it and finished. <laughs> Finally, yeah. And we'll be very happy with it. It's, yeah, I, I still, and I said it in the film, maybe it's not even in the cut, actually, you know, that he might just show up, because we really don't know if they're dead, really. Yeah. Like, I always show up for me, it's always like, yeah, he's somewhere around the corner. So, so in that good thought, I always hope that it disappears, we'll just show up again. Yeah. And just kill everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, uh, you can feel those levels of trust, like you mentioned, Dana, in the film, trust and intimacy. And you've really, all of you have created an incredible, beautiful document of a time, but also just an amazing, uh, intimate story. Yeah, it's really, really powerful in its subtlety. Thank you. So thank you. Thanks for yeah. sharing. It. So, so, and thanks everyone for joining us. I'll do a bit of work on this video uh, and then we'll put it up online so you can all share it publicly. In the meantime, please support the film, uh, direct everyone to the site. It is ayunifilm.com. Watch it on there, pay for it, pay for it twice, send the link to your friends and family to pay for it. Um, and then eventually no one will regret releasing their films online because they'll, they'll live just as well there as they would in the cinema. Yeah, true. Well, we, I mean, just to put it out there, we, we would really love to have a cinema screening when it is possible to do so as okay. well. <laughs> yeah, and to just have people in the room together. I mean, Nora and Maki and hopefully Dana and everyone like to share it together. Um, but until that day. <laughs> until that day. <laughs> That's the word. That would be amazing. Yeah, I would love to. I would love to see it in the cinema with everyone there. I can imagine it's even more powerful. So we hope if anyone has any links, um, let us know. Then they can show it in the cinema. Thank you. Uh, yeah, what's the easiest way to get in touch with you, follow you, see your work? Uh, on So the film has a Twitter and an Instagram, um, which is just Ayuni Film. And Yaz is, has a website, but is not really on social media at yes. all. I have to admit, I'm not. That's not the best way to contact savvy. her. <laughs> okay. Send an email through my website. But anyway, you can con anything related to the film will come to us through Twitter or the film. Yeah, through the film website, and her quality has pages everywhere as well that are fairly accessible. Cool. Great. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank it's you, everyone. Fun. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and hopefully, see you again at a similar event. Thanks, Saeed. Thanks, Saeed. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye